atmosphere from all of the nuclear testing and radiological accidents. Radioactive contamination is now in most of the food supply. There's only two ways to avoid this. Move south of the equator or properly protect your thyroid with nascent iodine. Looking to protect my family, I've done deep research. Nascent iodine is the purest, cleanest, absolute best form of iodine to protect yourself and your family. It's made right here in the USA, completely non-GMO. I searched out the best quality and now have developed a double strength form of nascent iodine exclusively available at InfoWarsLife.com. Nascent iodine is on record as one of the only safe ways to detox from fluoride poisoning. Survival Shield Nascent Iodine. Secure your super high quality nascent iodine today at InfoWarsLife.com. That's InfoWarsLife.com. The globalist social engineers are not just targeting us with propaganda. They are manipulating our genetics. We are being targeted at every level by estrogen mimickers that lower our testosterone and other hormones and natural compounds that the body needs. After consulting top doctors, nutritionists, pharmacists, and others, we have developed what I believe is the ultimate non-GMO organic super male vitality formula sourced from powerful organic herbs and then concentrated for maximum potency, Super Male Vitality was developed to activate your body's own natural processes instead of using synthetic chemicals. Super Male Vitality by InfoWars Life is so powerful that I only take half the recommended dose. For a limited time, we are offering 15% off Super Male Vitality at InfoWarsLife.com to introduce you to this powerful supplement. Visit InfoWarsLife.com today to secure your Super Male Vitality. InfoWarsLife.com One year ago from today, I received an email from Michael Hastings, and in that email it talked about how the FBI was after him and for his close friends and associates to be on the lookout for them as well. When I got that email, it was kind of odd because Mike never really emailed me back or sent me emails like that. It was always like, hey, how are you doing? So I kind of got a red flag. It felt weird. Hours later, I get a call that night and come to find out Mike's car blew up and he was dead. Meantime, there are questions multiplying today about the mysterious death of award-winning journalist Michael Hastings. Now, there's many speculations behind the death of Michael Hastings, but the way Mike was, he was on to so many hot stories at once that it was kind of hard to find out what it was at the time that he was on to. Because at the end of the email, it says, I'm on to a big story. I'm going to go underground for a little while, basically, and, you know, hopefully I see you guys soon. Well, here we are now, it's 2014 and it's a year later, and in 2012, Mike wrote a story for Rolling Stone, The Last a Prisoner of War, about Bo Bergdahl. And in the article, he's talking about a soldier who's disillusioned, who is disgusted with America, and walks off of his base. But no one pays any attention in this article whatsoever. We'll come to find out after numerous FOIA quests from two different uh, investigative journalists out of L.A., we now know that indeed the FBI had been investigating Michael Hastings for a year up to his death. They had bugged, you know, bugged him and been tracking him. So why are they lying? You know, in Michael's article, it says that the soldiers were given non-disclosures to sign and were not allowed to talk about it. So what Michael did was he went to Haley, Idaho. He spoke with Bob Bergdahl, uh, Bo's father, and what Bob did was show Michael uh, some emails that he had been getting from his son in Afghanistan just maybe a month or so after being there, said that he was, that he thought the army was disgusting, that this was a crappy war, and that if things didn't, you know, get interesting, he would just walk away. And now we know that that's what happened. You know, Michael knew when he wrote this back in 2012 that this would be a big story and could be the end of the Afghanistan war if the government used Bo as a pawn, so to say. I think this is the most significant and undercovered story about the war in Afghanistan from an American perspective. It's a story about the only prisoner of war uh, who's left in these two wars. First, the government angle 
And it was unprecedented, uh, the sort of wall of silence they tried to create over the Bo Bergdahl case. They made everybody in the, in the uh, brigade sign a non-disclosure agreement not to talk about Bo Bergdahl. So now we know that Mike went and spoke to Bob Bergdahl, and he also went to Afghanistan and spoke to soldiers from Bo's unit while they were in Afghanistan. So once we got that FBI document back, from the FOWI request, it said that the reason that Michael was being investigated was due to what he, what the FBI considered controversial journalism. Now, whatever that means, you know, I don't know. I don't think anybody knows what controversial journalism is. If journalism isn't controversial, then what's the point? Here we are a year later, and I sure think that this was more than just an accident. You know, a car doesn't just explode and then crash. It's very odd. Michael wasn't one of those guys who drove around recklessly. I mean, all this information we're hearing from people only leads down one way, and that this was a setup by the government to silence Hastings. And that's the only possible outcome I can see in this situation. You know, all I can say now is that we lost a great reporter, a journalist, and I lost a friend. From the water table, to our soils, to the atmosphere itself, our world is becoming more and more toxic each and every day. But it's not just the air outside that's toxic. Indoor air has been shown to have two to five times higher concentrations of pollutants than even outdoor air. And most Americans spend 90% of their time inside using toxic chemicals within their homes. There are more than 42 million smokers in the United States. Well over a thousand types of mold and mildew linked to numerous conditions. And don't forget the fact that six million Americans live with pets they're allergic to as well. When I began to research these statistics, it was clear to me it was time to start cleansing my lungs in order to combat the toxic environment that we cannot escape but that we can fight back against. Made with organic and wild cultivated herbs and manufactured in the USA, the new InfoWars Life Lung Cleanse is here in a convenient spray bottle that can be brought with you throughout any toxic environment. Now available exclusively at InfoWarsLife.com or by calling toll-free 888-253-3139. Introducing Pro One. All of your filtration in one system, portable, on the go. No more do you have two or three filters to just reduce sodium fluoride. You have a system that cuts out the sodium fluoride and up to 95% of hydrofluorosilicic acid. Advanced manufacturing technology combines silver impregnated white ceramic with new Aquamedics advanced media for removal of fluoride and other heavy metals, all in one filter element. It is the only one that does it and out of the gates, we have it discounted at 10% off with promo code WATER. This is the only system that in one unit helps reduce or remove pesticides, herbicides, chloramines, ammonia and chlorine, hydrofluorosilicic acid, the most common form of fluoride not covered by other fluoride filter brands, and sodium hexafluorosilicate. Get your Pro Pure with a new Pro One filter today at InfoWarsStore.com or by calling 888-253-3139. We've covered extensively colony collapse disorder and this mysterious die-off of the honeybee population. Well, it has just been reported that a major breakthrough in the efforts to genetically modify honeybees has been reported. Scientists were able to create a honeybee that contained a foreign gene. In this case, uh, one of, it was one that made some of the cells in the honeybee glow. Now, this is a first in bee research. We have seen them, uh, they've been able to make glowing kittens and glowing pigs. Now, uh, the researchers weren't able to establish a colony of genetically modified bees, but they only showed that genetically manipulated queens could produce genetically modified drones in the lab. So basically, it was proof that their concept could work further. So of course, a dwindling bee population is gonna be devastating for the future of mankind. If there are no bees, there is no pollination, and of course, the food supply will suffer. And this is kind of what's created this whole problem. The genetically modified crops could be adding to the die-off of the honeybees. 
Um, but today I'm going to be speaking with Marcus Hill. He is an apiculturist and a research scientist. And we're going to be talking about just what these genetically modified bees could mean for a dying bee population. So Marcus, thank you for joining us today. Thank now, you for having me, Leanne. So you've been an apiculturist and a researcher a little over eight years now. What have you been noticing with the, with the bee populations? Well, there's been a, a lot of reports of, of colony collapse disorder and things like that. A lot of invasive species from all over the planet. Everything from varroa mites to small hive beetles. Uh, and of course, all the attendant diseases that come along from industrial size agriculture. Um, when you have a mass influx of colonies, say, pollinating almond orchards, and then those colonies are then spread across from Northern California across the country, taking those pests and diseases with them. Uh, it's created quite, quite an issue for honeybee operations on large and small scales as well as feral populations. Um, everything from uh, pesticide exposure to cell phone radiation exposure to just, like I said, invasive species to just the natural, um, uh, how do I say it, just the natural uh, deterioration of the bee as it's overworked and on an industrial scale all play a part in what are called, what's called colony collapse disorder at this point. Right, and because this is now, I guess, such a huge issue, scientists are now kind of de developing ways to genetically modify the bees so that they can <laughs> manufacture their consent into their, you know, newly adapt into their environment. What do you think about these new GMBs? Well, there have been a, it's been a long time in the works. Uh, since the genome of the honeybee was mapped in 2006, there's been a problem in having the transgenic qualities express themselves in uh, the germ line stem cells of the honeybee itself. So what these researchers did, Christina Schultz et al., uh, were able to piggyback the uh, gene expression, uh, basically a phosphorescence in this case, and um, inject that with some modified RNA into a fertilized egg. That fertilized egg was then placed in, and this has happened with many replicates, they got about a 20% success rate, I think. That fertilized egg was placed in an un, um, a queenless colony. And so the worker bees in there fed that developing larva exclusively royal jelly, which allowed that fertilized egg to develop into a queen bee. That queen bee then was induced to lay unfertilized eggs because it had not been mated, so it could only lay unfertilized eggs. But those drones then had that genetic expression, the glow and the dark quality, and presumably, well, not presumably, they, they were able to carry that through their semen into the next generation, thereby opening up essentially Pandora's box in the sense that these transgenic expressions can be created throughout um, the... Um, reproductive process, meaning that as these queens, virgin queens go out and get mated, if they're mated with a transgenic drone, they're going to have that transgenic sequence in themselves, pass it on to their progeny, etc. So it's kind of like cracking the dam as well as cracking the code, you know? Right, exactly. I guess that was my concern is what happens if these bees are then begin mating with just your average honeybee? There, there's no turning back. Exactly. And one of the interesting things in the abstract that's uh, available online for this, this research study uh, experiment was that it sh the average beekeeper should be able to employ these methods and create their own transgenic lines. But of course, as other things, as honeybees are naturally mated in a lot of cases, the, those genetics, whatever they decide to put in, wherever, will find its way into the overall structure eventually, and God knows what mutations will result is from those. Um, right, exactly. And so what, obviously they're not trying to make phosphorescent bees. What do you right. think, what sort of science are they trying to come up with here? What, would, what do you think would be a valuable uh, additive for the bees? Well, in a lot of respects, they're looking into improving their immune systems. Um, uh, in, in, in nature, a honeybee's immunology is dependent a lot on propolis, which is um, tree sap. So they bring in this tree sap, which is antimicrobial, antiviral, antifungal, and they coat their inner hive with it. Modern industrial beekeeping uh, tries to phase out that propolis because it's very difficult for beekeepers to 
crack through it all as they're managing all these hives. And so that has played a part in weakening immune system as well as the uh, pesticides, et cetera. Um, so they're trying to figure out ways to bolster a honeybee's immune system. Um, to, and it sounds well and good, too. It, it opens up a, a great opportunity to understand better the biology of the honeybee, of social insects, of haploid, diploid insects, um, and the world of possibilities. 